Hi, welcome to the Black Box Software Testing Courses. My name is Kem Kainer. I'm a professor of software engineering at Florida Institute of Technology. I'm also the author of a few books on software testing. You can read more about me at my website, kainer.com. Now, I'm an amateur at this. There are some rough edges. I tape and edit these lectures at my home. The reason I do that is to maintain ownership of the materials, which lets me license them to you under a Creative Commons license. That lets you copy them and play them for other people for free. James Bach is the other primary creator of the content of this course. I think James is one of the brightest people in the field. It's been a privilege using his material. You can see more of his work at satisfice.com. Our third primary collaborator is Rebecca Fiedler. Her doctorate's in education, and she's the primary designer of the online version of this course. If your instructor read a book or took a course on how to teach this course, that book or course came from Becky. I'm the talking head on these videos, so I'm accountable for all the mistakes. But a lot of people deserve credit for the good bits. Along with James and Becky, I want to particularly thank Hong Kwok Nguyen, Doug Hoffman, and Michael Bolton. They've contributed a lot of material. Many more colleagues have helped significantly over 18 years of iterations in the development of this course. That includes some 32 instructors of online versions of the BBST courses. We've gotten a lot of feedback, and we really appreciate it. You get the slides for these videos from my lab's website. Throughout the series, we'll present testing as an investigation. A good investigator actively searches for information. They don't wait for it to be handed to them. The point of testing is to dig up information that people need to know about the product. There are a lot of ways to do this. You use the tools that are most effective under the circumstances, not some set of best tools. There are no best tools. There's no set formula for testing. There's no best procedure. There's no best practices. Different situations call for different approaches and different skills. At Florida Tech, we offer a certificate in software testing to students who complete this course and to others. We think this set provides a strong background in the fundamentals of software testing. People also use these lectures at university courses around the world because they're so closely connected to industry practice. So in university courses, professors often blend our material with work of their own. So some of the aspects of how I describe this course are going to be different in a different university's course. Across the series, we have a set of learning objectives. We won't achieve all of these in this course, but we're going to make progress against this list. This is what we're up to in this course. The first lecture introduces basic definitions in the field. Later lectures consider the key challenges of testing. But you need some other education besides testing content. As your career evolves, you're going to need a lot more education. The best educational choices are often going to be online. So we want to work on your skills for taking online courses and your communication skills. This course is probably designed a bit differently from what you're used to. First, the lectures contain a lot of material. We're packing a lot into a short course. The slides are very detailed. They have a lot of text. They're there for your reference. I don't repeat the slides to you. I always hated that as a student. I can read the slides for myself and so can you. So instead I talk about the ideas on the slides. And sometimes you're going to want to pause the tape to sync up between what you understand of what I'm saying and what you see on the slide. Second, you control the speed of the lecture. Most people learn more find it easier to pay attention when information comes to them a little faster than in a standard lecture. Much of the time you're going to want to set your video player a little fast. 1.2 times or even 1.5 times normal speed. You can also pause the lecture. Download this to your machine. Listen to 15 minutes now and 15 minutes later. You don't have to sit through the whole lecture at once. I wouldn't. Third, this class is tightly scheduled. We divide every week in two. One part ends Wednesday, the other part ends Saturday. Your discussions, your quizzes, your labs, your assignments, they're all due on a Wednesday or a Saturday. Our deadlines are firm. You must keep up. Other students depend on you to finish your tasks on time so that they can use what you've done, for example, to give you a peer review. Their time is tightly scheduled too. If you're late, you make them late. Can't do that. Fourth, we use orientation exercises. You might not have experienced these before. You do these tasks before you watch the video. The typical task requires you to stretch beyond what you know. Unless your instructor says otherwise, limit yourself to 30 minutes. It's okay if you don't successfully solve the problem. The goal isn't to solve the problem necessarily, it's to get you thinking about the problem. 
So when I cover it in lecture, you have enough experience with the difficulty of the problem to appreciate the solution and learn from it. There are also labs and assignments. Labs are typically homework you do on your own or with one other person. Assignments are bigger. The labs and assignments are where you apply what you've learned in lecture in order to build your skills. We also have quizzes. They're open book, but they're tough. Don't spend too much time on them. Don't let them demoralize you. They're there to help. They're there to help you study, to help you understand what you know and don't know of the material, and to help you develop precision reading skills. You'll get better with these over time. There's also a final exam. If you're taking the course from Florida Tech or from the Association for Software Testing, all of the questions in the final exam are drawn from a study guide list of questions that we expect you to study from. We expect you to develop your own answers to every one of these questions. This focuses your learning of the material. If you rely on someone else's answers instead of developing your own, you're going to learn very little worth knowing from this course. But this course is going to require some work. Students who pass the standalone one-month foundations course tell us they typically spend about 12 hours a week on the course. It's harder to predict your time needs for university courses. Those courses vary too much across universities. But what you should expect is that you're going to spend a little more than your average course time for this course. Okay, now it's time to talk about testing. I sometimes teach introductory programming at Florida Tech. The textbooks usually have this crazy definition. A program is a set of instructions for a computer. Defining programming that way is like defining a house as a set of construction materials that you put together according to a house design pattern. Yeah, you can define a house that way, but it misses the point of the house. A house is built for people to live in. If you don't understand who a program is written for and what it's designed to do for them, you understand precious little about that program. I think the biggest failing of computer science education is that we overemphasize the technical aspects of our field. Yes, certainly, students must develop many technical skills. You can't develop good software without having the technical skills. But when we ignore the purpose of the software and the people involved with the software, we teach our students bad mental habits that stay with them through years of experience. I want to suggest a different definition. The program is a communication from the authors to each other, to you, to other people. Yeah, the program is written in a simplified language because the computer needs that to run the program. But that's not the point of the program. We're not trying to make the computer happy. The computer is just a machine. Think about fixing a program that someone else wrote, or studying their program to figure out how your program can exchange data with it, or using a program in order to gain information from it. All of these are communications. If we focus on the machine, we don't notice the human factor, this communication between people. But we wouldn't write the code. We couldn't improve the code if we weren't conveying information to each other. Our next definition is quality. In the next course on bug advocacy, we'll consider several definitions of quality. But here we're going to focus on the one that we find the most useful. Quality is value to some person. This definition has two important aspects. First, value. To say that a change would improve the quality of a product means that the change will make it worth more. Or if a change is not made, the product should be worth less. Next, value to some person. Quality is subjective. What makes a product more valuable to you might make it less valuable, lower quality to someone else. For example, we could make a program a lot easier for you to learn if we make it work very similarly to a program that you already know. And it's quality for you, but for someone who doesn't know your favorite program or doesn't like it, this design might take quality away. And that brings us to the idea of a bug. Anything that takes away from the quality of a product is a bug. And that creates an interesting problem, because a bug for someone else might be a feature for you. This might be a broader definition of the idea of a bug than you're used to. Many programmers think that only coding errors can be bugs. But that's like thinking that programs are only code for the computer. It's a narrow view. In this course, and in the commercial world, we need to think more broadly about what makes products more valuable and what makes them less valuable. It's not just about how programmers intend the code to work. 